It was obvious in Windsor, as we stared at the coke pile, and it's very obvious in Amgenang, where refineries surround the community. We went to see Ada Lockridge, a local hero in Amgenang, who has continually battled against industry to go for a toxic tour of the Chemical Valley. Listen to this. So these guys are allowed to put out so much into the air. And if they don't put it all out, they can trade those credits or sell the credits to another company so Whoa. they can pump out more. So if one clean company is doing well and they're staying under their regulated emissions, they can sell that excess to a really bad company who can then extend. Yeah. We used to come back here and uh, we would, um, Solidarity Day, which is the National Aboriginal Day. So we would come back here and have canoe races, everybody, you know, like we'd go cool. canoeing and then whatever, they'd tip and ah, ha, 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 you know, <laughs> oh, it was all fun all games wet now. until we found out what was here. And we're yeah. like, oh my God. So we had to quit, quit having those games. So it's mainly mercury in here? That was what was found in the sunfish and stuff like that. We got concerned about the animals too because they're coming here and drinking. They don't know how to read. No, and, uh, they don't know what that sign means. Mm -hmm. And see our poor geese, they're all messed up. They don't know how to fly. Yeah, that's Do you know not how they're supposed to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're trying to tell us something. Not only has Ada been outspoken about pollution in Amgenang throughout her adult life, she actually does her own air testing with an apparatus called the Bucket Brigade that she uses to catch unreported leaks. Ada was cool enough to show me how the Bucket Brigade works. Okay, I'm gonna stick this part under there. So that's kind of like a, a lung. Right. You think of it as a lung that, whatever, so many minutes worth of breathing. So you've detected quite a few different leaks here. The most recent one was the hydrogen sulfide right. from Shell. So can you maybe walk through that discovery? My daughter showed up, like she lives in Corona, just south of the reserve here. So she came about 10 to 8. I was out here on my porch having my coffee and she showed up. She says, oh, mom, it, it's terrible out there. It's really bad. It smells like rotten eggs. So, all right, so I hurry up and got on the phone. Like I got Spills Action Center sack on speed call. So I called them up. Hey, something's leaking here. So that was about 5 to 8. By 8 o'clock, it was on the radio. Shell's calling the code 8. If they already know if they're leaking, why haven't they already said something? A lot of times we are the ones who notify the company. You are the siren. Yeah, that we usually say, hey, something's happening over there. I called in one time and they go, what's the wind direction? I was like, okay, the wind is coming from. And they go, and what's the wind speed is? Oh, let me go I check my... Uh... I said, um, <laughs> hang on, I'll lick my finger, open up the window and we'll count to see how long it takes to dry. We live in a situation now in Canada where the oil industry has tremendous power. I mean, some would say that they literally have a lock on the federal government. It falls then to the Ada Lockridge's of the world to stand up to this. Yeah. And so what is Ada? I mean, think about it for a second. There is Ada Lockridge, and in the past it's been, you know, other members of the Environment Committee with her, standing there with this, you know, pl plastic bucket and a filter in it, trying to register what's in the air that you can't see, you know, sometimes you can smell it, and then sending this, this, this filter off to California to get it analyzed and then being given a report. I mean, what is going on here? I'm Ada Lockridge, but they like to tease me. They call me Ada Brockovich. <laughs> <laughs> I've been called lots of names lately. <laughs> well, like the canary in the coal mine yeah, and yeah. all this kind of stuff. Normally, you know, there's the clash between natives and non-natives, and there's no reason for it. I no, mean, uh, like the chemicals don't care what color you are or anything anyway, so this is a human being thing, it's not a native thing. While the citizens of Amgenang have to worry about chemical leaks on a daily basis, so do the blue-collar workers in the Chemical Valley itself. We went up to North Sarnia, which looks like a pretty nice place to live, to meet with Jim, a veteran employee of the Chemical Valley. Jim invited us into his garage to sit in front of his bright red duster 
and discuss his lengthy career in the petrochemical industry. A lot of what we've been hearing is that some of the major problems from Chemical Valley are, are legacy issues. They're problems that happened in the 60s or the 50s and we're still just cleaning it up. But right. do you find that companies have been taking ownership of those issues? I don't believe so, no. I think they take ownership. Uh, like it's okay to say I didn't take the cookies, but when you get caught with your hand right in the jar, you can't deny it. So when they get caught with their hand in the jar, they take responsibility. When the cookies are gone, there's just a couple of crumbs sitting around. It wasn't me. I'm outside the Sarnia Lambton Environmental Agency. We're gonna go inside and speak with Dean Edwardson. Basically, anytime you send an interview request to an oil company to talk to them, he's the guy they refer you to. So we're gonna go in and speak with him about some of the concerns the community has. We're an overarching organization that looks at environmental quality from a, an ambient airshed, watershed perspective. Companies have their own environmental people that look at their sites specifically. Well, one of the problems we've heard about uh, time and time again is that uh, these sirens that these plants have don't go off in time. There was that leak I believe in January where a daycare called in, terrible smell, a bunch of kids went to the hospital with red eyes. The hospital didn't know what to do about it because they hadn't heard about the leak and like four hours later uh, Shell admitted to a leak. So if we're allowing the plants to do the monitoring and this is a real example of something that happened earlier this year, do you think that's a problem? Emergency response issues uh, oftentimes communication is one of your biggest problems. And in that case, I will freely admit that we had a communication problem. And clearly, uh, it was unacceptable. And I think if you ask Shell, they would say it was unacceptable. I would love to. <laughs> they told uh, me I'm going to tell you, they would tell you it was unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, any of our plants will tell you, impacting the community is not acceptable. And we're looking at things to try and improve that. But there were two more hydrogen sulfide leaks in the next four months after it. And one of them was only discovered by Ada Lockridge in her bucket testing. I mean, that if you're saying there was a communication problem in January, by May, when there was another hydrogen sulfide leak, shouldn't they have learned from their mistake? Again, I can't talk to you about that. It's under legal investigation right now. Okay, so what communication breakdown was it? That we that had a communication breakdown the between what occurred at Shell and the response for sounding our sirens and we're trying to fix that. We heard there were fish with tumors swimming around the Chemical Valley, which is alarming because many scientists see fish as an early indicator that something is very wrong with the environment. So we went down to Amgenong's fishing dock to speak with a fisherman who caught one of these toxic fish himself. Oh shit, yeah. He's got, you can see all, oh, you can see all the lumps like the, the, the lumps and stuff that are on it, and on, all, it was all over the tail. There was a big chunk on the, all these here. Are, you can see them there, there, see them all growing yeah, up. All yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2002, as a response to Suncor's attempts to build the country's largest ethanol plant in the Chemical Valley, an environmental committee was founded in Amshanong. We went up to meet with Wilson Plain, one of the founders in the environmental committee, to discuss the community's struggle. There was always always some interest in having a body that uh, monitor, monitors uh, what's going on around here. Personally, I, I, I have a post on Facebook that puts up uh, wind direction and temperature and what's happening. My interest is ongoing with respect to the environment. Now, we were in the cemetery and it's, it's an alarming juxtaposition between the Suncor refinery and the cemetery. Not a healthy place. <laughs> yeah. Um, we could have a funeral procession there and we would get caught by uh, those uh, emissions in here. A lot of times when we hear about a leak, the plants will maybe be able to blame each other because they're both emitting that pollutant and one yeah. says, well, it might be the other one. Does that, does that kind of thing happen a lot? I think the, uh, the Ministry of the Environment needs to I'll monitor the direction of the wind. Like if we started off with a bag of uh, pollutants, one, just from one, what would it be like if we have five different sources? Yeah, if you had sources. a bag and I had a bag and we both opened our bags, there's a big, <laughs> bigger bag up there. <laughs> yeah. And who's, who's watching the big bag? Yep. Nobody. 
that the cumulative issue is is the main uh, the main issue in Amjani. But there needs to be an ongoing monitoring of, of the uh, worst offenders of those pollutants, and benzene being the top one, I think. Even though the Ministry of the Environment didn't return our phone calls, they can and will step in to prosecute industry. In 2005, the Nova Chemical Plant had a serious benzene leak that lasted more than 15 hours. It was so severe that Amjanong was completely evacuated and Nova was fined over half a million dollars. The health effects of benzene are well documented in the scientific literature. The International Agency on the Research of Cancer, IARC, designates it as a definitive human carcinogen. It's connected with leukemia, all kinds of blood-related cancers. And what we have are thousands of tons of this very toxic chemical being released in Sarnia every year. Nobody is really tracking the communities that are getting the biggest exposure. Would you say that the amount of benzene is, is higher in Sarnia than most no, other places? No, I would not. So despite having plants in Sarnia that emit benzene, there's no higher emissions quality here? We are consistent. The level of benzene that we saw on our ambient monitors are consistent with which, what you will find in other urban centers in Canada and the United States. My grandson, who used to live about one and a half kilometers basically west from here, died as a result of uh, leukemia. He, uh, he's not with us anymore. He was 13. So don't know where my grandson uh, took a deep breath or took a several, several deep breaths, but benzene would be the cause of that leukemia. Why should these industries be trusted? I don't think that anybody's asking anybody to trust the industry. You, trust has to be earned. And I think that our companies are trying to earn that trust. Obviously, trust oftentimes is predicated on your performance. You can be a great guy, but you go murder somebody, all of a sudden you're a murderer. You're probably not a great guy then. <laughs> Pardon me? You're probably not a great guy Well, in obviously, I mean, but you know, it's like everything else is that, uh, you know, you do the best you can to operate, but as soon as you have an incident, um, you know, it, it causes people to maybe... Uh, Think you're a murderer. Uh, well, yeah. We're walking through a park that's completely fenced off because of all the asbestos contamination. So this only happened a few weeks ago. The park's basically abandoned as a result, which is a bummer because it's right in the center of the city. And it's definitely a beautiful spot to spend some time. It's really serene and peaceful if it weren't for the mass amounts of uh, pollution, contamination, and fencing. So even though this park is totally contaminated with asbestos, there's no actual signage from the city anywhere indicating that. But there are these two little handwritten notes. Uh, it says, this is a memorial for those that died and suffered because of Chemical Valley. It's behind a fence because the government found out that this park is also polluted by toxic chemicals. So that says it all. After worrying about whether or not we inhaled any airborne asbestos in Centennial Park, we met up with Sandy Kennard one of the founders of the Victims of Chemical Valley Foundation, to discuss how the Chemical Valley has continued to negatively impact Sarnia and how the workers of the industry who fall fatally ill are treated. People like to blame. He, he just had a way with people. I feel that I am truly blessed to have married this man. I fell in love with this man when I was in grade five. And I got to marry him. And uh, that doesn't always happen in life. He was always good-natured. He came home from work one day and said, I can't breathe. It was a hot, humid day, and I just I thought, oh, okay, so... Um, but realizing he was having a hard time breathing, got him to the doctors. So they admitted him, drained seven liters of fluid from his lung, with his heart and trach pushed to the side, and they didn't know why he was still alive. They finally diagnosed him with mesothelioma. You have four months to live. Get your life in order. This was the feature section in the 
the Globe and Mail called Dying for a Living. If it takes one man to use his picture to change what's, what's happening, then that's a good thing. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to take his shirt off. He wanted to show people what asbestos will do to you. And he said, I want people to know I didn't go to work to die. He died in 2004. When he got sick in 2002, my brother-in-law came to the house to say, as a man would, um, don't you worry, we'll make sure everything's okay for, for her. Uh, November that year, my brother-in-law who came to the house was diagnosed with stomach and bowel cancer. So in total, we've lost five people in my family to mesothelioma, and that does not include all the other types of cancers that have come into the family. I think people don't talk about it because that's where dad worked. That's where grandpa worked. And you'll hear this from a lot of the men. Well, you know, I, I had a good life. I made, I made great money and, um, you know, I guess it's my time. Well, you shouldn't be dying at 57 years old. I, I don't know if you've been down to the Chemical Valley to, in the night drive, take the drive down Vital Street and how all the lights are there. Well, as a child, that was part of a Sunday evening, you know, go down, the lights are all there, they're all on, and boy, that just looked like fairyland to us. All the sparkly lights, and wasn't that pretty? My father was an electrician. And back in the day, those tanks were kept pristine looking. The gardens were beautiful. It was lovely to see. And we were proud that we lived in the Chemical Valley. And it wasn't until, gosh, after my husband died, it was like, duh, we don't see that anymore. The flowers are dead, the trees are all dying, the drums are all scungy down there. It looks derelict down there because they don't have to keep up the pretense anymore. The gig's up and you know, the word's out and it is what it is now. It's the Chemical Valley.